like I mentioned when I introduced this, there is a lot going on in what feels like a short amount of time. A, a ton of projects are kind of taking off and, and getting underway. Um, and we wanted to share with you some of those that we thought really had a, a interest that that should be highlighted. Get folks uh, knowing what's going on early and be able to also participate in those projects as, as that work is being done. So we're going to do a lightning round to go through five um, TWDB contracted studies that are ongoing. And we've got four folks here to talk about them. I'd like to welcome Mike Keister with Leonard Rice Engineers, Van Kelly with Antera, Bridget Scanlon uh, with UT Austin's Bureau of Economic Geology, and Rohit Goswami with WSP. So um, we're going to do this, like I said, it's a lightning round, about seven minutes per project. We're going to save all the questions for the end. Um, and so if you do send me a question in the in the chat feature, just be sure you're telling me who you want to ask that to because it might be tricky for me to, to keep track as, as they build up. Um, but we do, do want to hear from you all and have questions, but we also want to make sure we get through all of these projects. So with that, I'm going to turn my camera off. Mike, you are up first, so I will turn it over to you. Welcome and thank you guys. All right. Well, uh, thank you very much, Leah. Thank you for uh, giving us the opportunity here to uh, present some information to you with regards to a project that uh, Water Development Board uh, got this project kicked off uh, mid, mid, last, mid to late last year. Uh, we got work got got to work trying to figure out what's a what, looking at the historical pumping uh, that occurred primarily out in West Texas. So for this project, uh, we teamed up with uh, WSP, uh, working with them on this project, and as well as on a project that overlaps a lot of the same study area. Uh, we're also working with Thornhill Group and Michelle Sutherland to help us figure out kind of what's going on out here uh, in this area that. Involves five uh, five aquifers: uh, the Pecos Valley, the Edwards Trinity Plateau, the Hill, Trinity Hill Country, Edwards, and then the Lipan as a minor aquifer out there. But a lot of different uh, aquifers, a very large study area. Uh, trying to get an idea of you know how much pumping has occurred in the past. Um, the study area that covers 35 different conservation districts, 56 counties, and uh, six different regional water planning areas. So actually, it's, it's a pretty good sized area. And what the Water Development Board was really looking to do was to try to kind of understand, uh, look at available data, look at what's already out there, what we can gather from it in order to develop a consistent, uh, defensible data set for the groundwater availability modeling program and for use within that program in developing as they as they update the model that covers this area so uh thank you for going next slide there uh the project's involved in really looking at broken down into three different phases uh first of all uh water Bone board asked us to take a look at uh or the, the gamp group there to take a look at the water use survey data uh, this day, this pro first phase of the project involved trying to go out and collect a lot of data. Uh, I'm sure you're, many of you saw the uh, stakeholder outreach that we did. Uh, appreciate uh, TAG for helping us uh, posting it on their website and helping us get the word out about the project. And then we used that data and really tried to look for any issues or anomalies that there might be within the water use survey data available from the Water Development Board and how and then with the second phase of the project going okay any any of those anomalies we identified how do we try to address those or make adjustments to develop this consistent data set uh, that can be used within the modeling program uh, that that second phase of the first phase of that project it ended back in october of last year uh, we're about to wrap up the second phase of the project here uh, just in a few days and then the next big phase of the project which is going to take the most time is really going in and uh, addressing those issues and then developing that pumping data set along with some tools that can be used uh, potentially be used in other parts of the state to develop the, uh, to apply really a, a very consistent methodology towards developing these pumping data sets so if we go ahead and go to the next slide uh, 
you'll see that yeah there's really a lot big part of that goal is developing that data set that's going to be as accurate as possible for uh, updating updating the GAMs within the study area. As you can see, there's several models out there that are covering the study area, uh, developed by the Water Development Board, developed by the USGS. And part of this project is really go, they're, they're looking to update this, the models for this whole area, understanding that pumping it can be a significant uh, factor in both uncertainty, but also in how it affects the aquifer and the calibration of the model. Uh, one of my cohorts on the panel here, uh, Mr. Kelly, actually pointed this out when they were doing the uh, update of the Northern Trinity Woodbine Gam. It was they pointed out in there that yeah, that's pumping can be an issue for, for these models, and it need, we need to develop these data sets that are as accurate as possible. So that's really what the goal here. One of the goals of this project is to develop the process for this area that can continue to be then expanded and, and applied elsewhere. And with that, uh, that's kind of the quick 10,000 foot view of what this project's all about. And I'll uh, pass it on. You're up next, Rowett. Okay, yeah, I, I don't know if you want me to start, start already. <laughs> uh, so yeah, I, I'll just let you guys move through these because you'll see okay. your slides pop up from here on out, all right? Thanks. All right. Thanks a lot. Yeah, if you can move to the previous slide, please. I just wanted to introduce our partners there. So yeah, thank you. Thank you, Leah and, and uh, Tag D for, for inviting us um, to present these projects. Um, it's a, this, this particular one is a good segue uh, after, you know, Mike introduced the pumping project. Um, as he said, we had teamed up with them on the pumping project um, and we are priming this one and uh, LRE and Mike um, and Jordan are working with us on this project. Um, as well as uh, Dr. McCord with IRP Water and also Dr. Srinivasan, our professor Srinivasan at uh, Texas A&M. So uh, again, this is for the GAM team at the uh, Texas Water Development Board. Uh, as Mike can introduce the area, I just like to say it's pretty much very similar area. We're, we do not have LIPAN as part of this contract. But other than that, it's pretty much a similar area. And uh, let's uh, let's move on to the next one here. Yeah. So again, the the project objective is to estimate groundwater recharge, and then also estimate groundwater surface water interactions. Um, and as Mike mentioned, the goal of the GAM team. I don't want to speak for them, but they're looking to update the models or it develop a single model for the entire study area um, as the case might be moving on. And as they develop that uh, in-house, um, the goal here is to take in some of these, uh, two of the most, as Mike said, um, uncertain, uh, um, sorry, uncertain uh, parameters going in, which is pumping and then recharge um, and, and, and get estimates of it ind independently. So, um, as our team, combined teams work on both projects, there's some synergy there um, as like how much assumptions we're making or what assumptions we're making in which particular areas. Uh, the technical approach here is to do detailed distributed hydrologic modeling and, and, and stream flow analysis. In the preliminary identification of models, we've looked at the soil water balance model, the SWOT model and groundwater toolbox. Um, and we are conducting um, preliminary model results from these particular models um, to uh, report to the GAM team and for the internal review. Uh, please go on. So our next steps are going to be, as we keep modeling, we calibrate to the available data. Um, and also we compare the model results to sort of come up with um, an estimated range of what recharge estimates could be and also what groundwater surface water interactions could be. Um, the overall um, sort of our internal goal is to develop for each particular area or region that we identify um, or watershed that we identify, uh, we can estimate um, at least um, multiple um, recharge estimates so we can compare them. 
please keep going. So that's our sort of overall workflow. I don't want to go too much into technical details of it. So just wanted to keep it sort of bird's eye view. So we start with our objective, we go ahead and identify model, we input the data, uh, do model selection, calibration, uh, look at what the calibration decision is, uh, and we keep repeating that until we get um, um, our um, um, acceptable model results. And then we uh, do a comparative analysis and present those results. Keep going. The project timeline is that our final report um, is expected to be ready by the end of the year. And that's when the stakeholder meetings are expected to be held. Uh, Texas Water Development Board um, will, will uh, and, and, and the GAM staff will uh, reach out to them and um, um, communicate when these stakeholder meetings um, are ready or when the draft deliverables are ready to be communicated out. Uh, the, the, for more information, you can contact uh, Cindy, who's Cindy Ridgeway, who's the manager of the GAM team at Texas Water Development Board, or Mr. Robert Bradley, who's the contract manager for Texas Water Development Board, um, and also part of the grammar staff there. Or you can contact myself. I'm the project manager for this particular work, and my contact information and phone number is there. Thank you. Hi, um, my name is Bridget Scanlon, and I'm going to talk about water use estimates and projections in the Texas mining and oil and gas industries. Um, this project was initiated in December 2020 and is projected to be completed by March 2022. Um, the funding is from the Texas Water Development Board, but originates from the USGS Water Use Data and Research Program grant. Uh, the purpose of this study was to update uh, a previous um, analysis that uh, Jean-Philippe Nicot did uh, that was published in 2011. Uh, I would like to acknowledge the other people working on this study, uh, JP Nicot, Bob Reedy, and uh, Chen Yang. And um, our contract manager is uh, Katie Dahlberg. Uh, next slide, please. So, um, there are six tasks within the study. The first three relate to oil and gas, and task four and five refer to coal, lignite, and aggregates. And the last one is a coordination task with the USGS. Uh, so the first three tasks, task one, is to quantify uh, current and historical water use for hydraulic fracturing and produced water volumes. And also to determine what sources of water are being used for hydraulic fracturing. Um, mostly uh, aquifers uh, are some produced water reuse. And then to develop projections of future water demand for hydraulic fracturing and um, over the life of the place, which could extend from 2030 uh, through 2080. Uh, the coal, lignite and aggregate studies uh, are, uh, we will identify the locations of these operations and uh, quantify current and projected water use for coal and lignite mining and for aggregates. And we will rely heavily on surveys of these industries to determine estimates. And lastly, we will coordinate uh, with the, the USGS personnel. And for example, the uh, USGS 2015 National Water uh, Use Report, they included produced water in the Permian in their water use for oil and gas. And that differs from what the water development board uh, presented. So I'm going to talk a little bit about a couple of the tasks, um, but not all of them. So task one, uh, quantifying current and historical water use for hydraulic fracturing and produced water volumes. So the data sources for hydraulic fracturing water use include a frac focus database and the IHS database. And we'll cover approximately the past 10 years, 2009 through 2020. And uh, the major unconventional oil and gas plays in Texas include the Permian, Eagle Ford, Barnett, and Haynesville. And uh, one of the aspects of water use is how much produced water is reused for hydraulic fracturing. And there are no 
uh, explicit reporting of that. And so we will survey oil and gas operators to determine how much reuse of produced water is occurring. Um, for example, in 2018, uh, in the Permian Basin, they drilled about 1,200 wells uh, for high, uh, to source water for hydraulic fracturing in the Ogallala, just gives you an idea. Uh, and the average water use was about 17.5 million gallons per well. Uh, produced water volumes, uh, we will use the IHS database and a similar time period, but there's a generally a lag of about a year on produced water reporting. And uh, we will focus on wells in unconventional reservoirs, and we will compare produced water volumes with the uh, water that is disposed in saltwater disposal wells as sort of a check um, on the produced water volumes. Um, next slide, please. So task three uh, involves developing projections of future uh, water demand for hydraulic fracturing. And um, it seems kind of crazy to think that we can project anything when we are uh, living in a current pandemic with the oil and gas prices much lower than previously anticipated, but we still try. Um, so we will determine um, well inventory in each of the unconventional plays, and we assume technically recoverable resources and that means that all potential wells would be drilled uh, with the, the most recent spacing, both horizontally and vertically. And, um, and we develop these estimates at a resolution of about uh, a square mile grid scale. And um, we've done projections in the past, and so we will be refining those projections for the in the future. And um, because we know that not all projected wells will be drilled, in the Permian, for example, we're only considering two out of 10 potential units, the Wolf Camp A and B, which have been the most productive in the past, and we're neglecting the other units. So if we overestimate because we're considering that all wells would be drilled in those units, we're underestimating because we're not considering all of the potential units. Uh, so we're working with Texas Oil and Gas Association, Texoga, and uh, CJ Treadway is establishing a work group uh, so that we can uh, bounce our ideas off of them and, and also develop estimates of produced water reuse. Um, so information on this study is available at uh, the Water Development Board's website, um, as uh, shown below. And as I mentioned earlier, Katie Dahlberg is the project manager. Um, next slide. So uh, for the insomniacs in Texas, we, we publish stuff occasionally. and um, so last January, we published a study on uh, water um, use for oil and gas production in the US. And in the diagram on the right, you can see um, bubbles uh, referring to different water volumes. So the blue uh, spheres refer to the projected water demand for hydraulic fracturing in the different plays, and the gray refers to the produced water volumes over the life of the play, approximately 30 years. So you can see in the Permian Basin, the Delaware Basin on the west and the Midland Basin on the east, these are the largest spheres. And um, we estimate the projected hydraulic fraction water demand would be uh, equivalent to about how much water we use in the state uh, in 2017, about 14 million acre feet. And uh, the projected produced water volumes are about three times the water use in typical water use in the state. Um, and you can see in the Delaware Basin, uh, they produce much more water than they need for hydraulic fracturing. And so the legislature is very interested in evaluating different potential uses for this water. Um, last slide, please. So another uh, study, we evaluated uh, potential uses of uh, treated uh, produced water uh, in the US and looked at uh, irrigation and uh, uh, discharge to surface water and, and um, there are many studies, uh, there are some studies going on at the moment, particularly in New Mexico, evaluating treatment technologies, economics, uh, to treat the produced water uh, to, for example, discharge to the Pecos River or to use in irrigated agriculture. Um, so that uh, gives you an idea of some of the previous work and we'll be leveraging off of this in the current study. Thanks very much. So, um, again, I'm, I'm Rohit Goswami with WSP, 
And this project um, is about delineating areas designated or used for class two wastewater injectate. Um, WSP for this particular project teamed up with Gustafson uh, Associates, which are now a member of WSP. So they're, they are WSP. And um, SS Papadopoulos and Associates, which some of you might have known uh, uh, from, from, the, from the modeling work. Please keep going. Uh, just a project overview here. Um, so the way this project came to being, and again, I don't want to speak for Texas Water Development Board, just a little bit of background though, is uh, there was a legislative mandate to uh, designate brackish groundwater production zones. Um, and the way uh, uh, the, the law was written, it said uh, these brackish groundwater production zones or BGPZs should not be impacted by class two wells. Um, and uh, 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 while in, in, the, in the previous BRAC studies where they were delineating these um, um, brackish trauma production zones, they used a default buffer zone of 15 miles. Um, and what the, <clears throat> with, with this project, the aim here is to come up with a regional analysis, Texas-wide study, um, uh, which includes you know 100,000 100, plus class two injection wells in the Railroad Commission database and come up with a scientifically defensible uh, buffer zone analysis, uh, which we're working on right now. And um, internally, there is a work group for, uh, formed, which includes uh, Railroad Commission, uh, our, our staff, um, our team members from Railroad Commission, Texas Commission on Environmental Quality, DCEQ, uh, TDLR, of course, TWDB staff, um, uh, BEG, uh, Bridget is on the, on the work, work, uh, work group panel, um, we have representation from UD El Paso, USGS, utilities, um, Leah from, from DAG-D is there. Uh, and of course, industrial organizations like Texas Oil and Gas uh, uh, and some of the other industry members are on the panel. So it's a very strong work group um, and we hope to have more uh, meetings with them as we're doing our analysis and get feedback from them on our draft work done. Um, so, um, and this is just a preliminary sketch of like, uh, you know, uh, where, which, which are the primarily uh, identified aquifers where this analysis is to be done. And uh, those little black dots there are the uh, class two injection wells that we know about from the Railroad Commission database. Keep, keep going. Um, so this is just sort of a, uh, overview. So as we do this analysis, there there are certain aqu aquifers that have been identified, but there really are no class two injection wells that are in those aquifers that we see. So the study would take some assumptions and um, you know some more, um, uh, um, you should say, broader depth of knowledge than what it might be available, and and that's what we are analyzing right now. Keep going. And then in certain other areas like you know, the Dockham, we have a lot of data in the southern part, but we really don't have much on the northern section. So again, you'll have to go off of some assumptions while we're doing these analyses and um, expect uh, some feedback from our work group panel uh, on how to approach. Please keep going. Um, again, the project timeline, we expect the report to be finalized and available by fall 2021. So really, not not much of uh, not much of time left within this year to complete the study, and um, we can contact uh, Eric Mancha, who's the manager for uh, the Innovative Water Technologies Group, uh, which is sort of uh, the which also encompasses the BRAC team, um, and um, Juan Acevedo, he's our contract manager uh, within the BRAC team staff. Uh, or myself, I'm the project manager for, uh, for this um, for this work, and my contact details are available there. Thank you. All right, <clears throat> can y'all hear me? I hope so. Good. Uh, thank you. Uh, I'm going to talk about. Uh, I guess I'm I'm the caboose here. I'm going to talk about a study that's being performed for the Brax Group. Um, called Brackish Groundwater Commingling. And uh, my uh, contract manager over at Water Development Board is James Golab, so I'd like to give him uh, identification here. So first off, 
why why come England? Well, as I think you are all aware on this call, it's defined in the um, TDLR water well drillers and pump installers rules, tax 7610. And it's defined as the mixing, mingling, blending, combining through borehole casing or annulus, or the filter pack of water that differs in chemical quality. So that's, that's kind of broad, which causes quality degradation. That's kind of broad and is not defined of any aquifer that is defined or zone. Uh, we, we're brought, brought again. So, uh, you know, there's been discussion about commingling and and whether this, you know, what does this necessarily mean for uh, test well, say? Um, and so it obviously has relevance for brackish groundwater development also. TDLR uh, pulled together a, a uh, advisory council to look at this issue back in 2018, the very beginning. And they actually had a, a summit, which was very well attended with both written and uh, verbal uh, testimony. And they posed five questions, which I have down there. And, and I won't read them all, but you know, to, the, to these questions, how would you define degradation? Uh, you know, would mixing 20,000 with 30,000 milligrams per liter be considered commingling? Next slide, please. So the Water Development Board, um, in further discussions decided, well, our objective here is to document a scientific assessment of brackish groundwater commingling issues statewide with some focus on three specific areas um, to basically provide some more information for this discussion to go forward. And the study scope is currently broken into eight tasks, but really if you look at the technical task, there's three. There's task three, a review of statutes and terminology, which is ongoing right now. There's task four, a statewide assessment of commingling issues. So um, that was a really, really good presentation that Andrea put forth, but it is not going to be at that level, I can assure you. Um, and then an assessment of sec select aquifers and regions. So let's, let's go to the next slide, please. So the three areas that were chosen um, for us to really focus in and try to try to develop more data-driven um, conceptual models for the potential for commingling and how it could occur and how it might occur were the Gulf Coast Aquifer in yellow there, uh, from co you know from river to river, um, the Eagleford area, which is basically coming up from the Rio all the way up. Technically, it even goes a bit past the Brazos River, but I, I cut it off at the Brazos there. Most of the development is south of Gonzales County, um, but there you've got the Creso Wilcox, Yewa Jackson, Queen State Sparta, and then finally the Trans Pecos Aquifer, which is obviously in the Permian Basin. Um, a lot of activity in oil and gas out there, as Bridget was just talking about, and a very uh, and a large mix of aquifers. So this is this task is also ongoing because we're really deciding to dive into the details before we go back and try to get a do a a, a 30,000 foot look at the state as a whole. Next slide, please. And uh, you've heard the story. Um, we kicked this off about the tur turn of the uh, year and uh, we will be turning in draft reports, um, basically progress reports as we go, but the finals Final report be at the end of June. And so what you might say, okay, well, you know, how is this going to be relevant potentially to management of groundwater resources? And I think, you know, I, I can't honestly tell you exactly right now. I'm I'm a little bit looking in the keyhole, but our objective is to provide documentation to support further discussions about the definition of commingling and what might qualify as commingling, what reasonably and scientifically might qualify as commingling in a brackish groundwater setting, because that's our focus here. Next slide, please. So, uh, just as Rowett was talking, stakeholder outreach is critical in this one. Uh, our first stakeholder meeting will be held virtually on February 5th. Uh, Leah and Tagdi have been kind enough to include us in their email blasts. Um, so we've, I think we're already in that for this first stakeholder meeting. And if we're not, we'll be in it this week. Um, Please feel free to contact me 
on any issues associated with this. I, I know from the interest in the um, in the uh, the summit, which was held in 2018, that there are a lot of um, there's a lot of interest and there's a lot of different views out there. And so I just posed some questions because I know you'll get these slides, and I would really urge you to to look at them and think about them. And if you have um, any answers to those or want to discuss any of those, please please reach out and and call me, uh, email me, um, whatever, uh, because you know, I know this is relevant to GCDs, um, and I think that's it. Yeah, and so there's my contact info, and there's James's contact info also, and I appreciate y'all having us here today. Well, thank you, everybody, for that. That was really helpful and a, a great overview of a lot of uh, really relevant work going on. All at the same time, like, your deadlines are really short, particularly given a lot of them seem to overlap with the legislative session. Um, we do have a few questions that have come in, um, and I'm going to try to sort of organize these by um, in, in order that we went here. So, Mike, I'll maybe start with you. Um, got a question about whether or not you feel like, based on the work you've done so far, you've gotten some good data in on that historic company. Like, do you feel like you've got a good data set and that's really going to result in a, a much improved data set going forward? Well, for the second part, yes, we're gonna we're really working on trying to improve the data set uh, moving forward. Getting that data, there are several data sources that we're trying to pull together to create that consistent data source across the uh, time frame. Uh, we received quite a bit of information from stakeholders. Uh, we're integrating that data right now as we're developing the plan for that that'll be part of the third phase of really compiling and preparing that data set, but uh, Yes, we feel like we've gotten quite a bit of good information from from the stakeholders, and then we've been able, been able to identify where there appear to be some inconsistencies in the water use survey data, and are now looking to uh, apply some methods that can be repeatable and develop tools for for doing just that, developing the best data set possible. Mm -hmm. And then kind of following up on that, um, someone asked whether or not you had a sense yet about the magnitude and revisions to pumping estimates you might see. Not really. We've been focusing really on some test cases right now uh, as we develop the plan. So they've been looking at really much smaller areas than, than the whole area. Uh, so I can't say there's necessarily going to be some really massive changes, but we do see some very specific changes that will be uh, made in some areas. So I'm uh, sorry, I just can't answer that one well yet. Absolutely, great. And then this one is kind of, I think, maybe goes to both Mike and Road at the same time with the um, overlapping study areas, whether or not that was intentional. Um, and were, are these projects kind of working in tandem for a reason? Yep, definitely. So I think I briefly mentioned that uh, that that was the intention of the GAMP program, that both these projects came out in the same time because they're looking to update models or uh, develop a single model for that particular study area, um, for which you know quantitative estimates from both these projects was kind of feed into. Uh, Mike, you want to add to that? No, like uh, I think Rohit had summed it up well there that. Uh, the, uh, the projects were launched at the same time, and uh, yeah, I think there was a reason for it. So. Okay, great. And then, Ro, I had a question come in for you um, about your um, methodology. How are you going to for the for the recharge estimates um, study first? Is the one we're talking about. Um, what what methodology do you anticipate using for that? Right, so as I have kind of briefly discussed this, uh, it'll be distributed hydrological modeling. So we'll be using tools like um, soil water balance model, SWOT model, and then um, groundwater toolbox in areas where it's appropriate to use. Mm -hmm. And I think you mentioned as well that this was going to be kind of on a watershed geographic right. So, right, because these tools are different. Um, so um, I think the soil water balance model is more of a grid based study. So um, that'll be slightly different than, say, SWAT, which goes sort of a HUC 12 by HUC 12 watershed 
uh, process um, versus Grammar Toolbox, which I think is based on Huck 6 boundaries or Huck mm -hmm. 8 boundaries, if I'm not mistaken. Yeah. And where do you um, anticipate getting your data from? That's a good <laughs> That's a good question. We've been collecting a lot of data from wherever it's available. So um, a lot of the stream flow uh, data comes, of course, from USGS. Um, a lot of the climate data, we're getting it from different sources. Um, but um, for it to be for the end in which we intend to compare the results from the studies, um, we want the input data going in to be the same. So that's the, the that's the place we are at right now, where we want to make sure that all our input data is very similar. Right. And uh, for and and then we're also looking into, and this is not uh, this is not kind of final yet, but we'll also look at whatever remote sensing data is available for comparison purposes. Okay, great. Um, and then I'm just kind of keeping an eye on the time and because I want to hit at least a couple questions on each of the different studies. So Bridget, I was going to move on to the mining new study. Um, how how are the results of this, the outcome of your mining new survey, um, do you anticipate them being used? Oh, you're muted. Um. So for uh, water use uh, data for planning purposes, uh, it should give uh, people an idea of how much water might be used for hydraulic fracturing in the future and how that compares with the managed available groundwater and uh, whether they need to figure out more sources of water. Uh, and also we'll be looking at uh, trends in produced water reuse and so and that would decrease uh, water demand. So. Uh, and looking at these things spatially and temporally. Mm -hmm. And then I know you mentioned some of the sources from which you are going to be getting your um, historic data. Are you going to be reaching out to groundwater districts to see if they've got pumping data that you would incorporate as well? Um, yes. Um, so, I mean, we will be using the TDLR data to figure out what wells are used for uh, rig and frac supply and stuff, and then we'll compare those depths with the uh, GAMs to determine which aquifers they're tapping into. Uh, we have pretty good data from frac focus on how much water is used for hydraulic fracturing, but we certainly will be connecting with the, the GCDs to um, you know, check what we're finding and, and to get more uh, greater insights into what's going on. Mm-hmm. And then I'll just, I, I know you did touch on this, but there a question did come in, I think it's worth kind of reiterating, is the role that um, economics um, play in in trying to do this sort of projecting in terms of, of mining use and what you're doing to build into your survey um, a way to account for that or if you are able to do that at all. Well we have um, we've done that in the past with the low and high price scenarios and stuff but we never hit the rock bottom that we saw this year <laughs> so we never projected it to go that low. Um, so I, I don't think in this study that we will have enough uh, flexibility to uh, incorporate economics, uh, but uh, we have done it for some plays in the past um, to understand uh, how sensitive the results are to different price scenarios. Okay, great, thanks. And then Ro, back to you in the in the um, buffer zones for the um, for the brash groundwater production zones. Um, I got a question here about your stakeholder, um, the work group, and whether or not that was open to new people participating. That's probably a question for uh, for RAC staff. Um, so they should really reach out to um, Eric R. Juan. Um, yeah, we, we they are the ones who kind of put together the work group. So that's kind of on their side. Okay, great. And that contact information, for those of you out there that might be interested, we'll be we'll, we'll have these presentations posted um, with that contact information as well as these recordings, so that that will be available. Uh, another question came in about um, what you kind of, if you had at all, a vision of what you might be recommending in terms of changes to that buffer zone. Yeah, we're we're not there yet. Uh, we're we're very early in the study uh, right now, uh, so we're going aquifer by aquifer. Um, and right now, I mean, we've not even finalized what kind of modeling approach we're going to take. So again, that's that's something we'll discuss with the work group, and we'll take their feedback on that. 
Mm-hmm. But and it would not be a default, like, you know, like it would it would not be like a 15 mile thing. I mean, I think that was more... the point. Like, is it going to be more nuanced than that or yes. site specific, aquifer specific, or are we just yes. going to change it from 15 to 12? <laughs> Um, no, no, yeah, it's, it's going to be aquifer specific for the most part. Uh, that's our intention for sure. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. And to make that change, is there a change to statute needed, or or is that something that that can be done without going to the legislature for those buffer zones? Yeah, that, I, I'm I'm not comfortable <laughs> addressing legal questions. <laughs> Sounds good. So on that note, actually, maybe that's a perfect segue, Van, into <laughs> yours. A, a question came in about, um, it sounds like you could use some lawyers on your team um, when you're reviewing the statutes on, on commingling. <laughs> yeah, I could. And so if anyone needs to get their free credits, they can contact me and I'll, uh, <laughs> I'll bring them on board right away. <laughs> yeah, 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 it's, uh, yeah, it, it, admittingly, I mean, it's, uh, that's why the reviewing the uh, the administrative code and the statutes was step one. Where am I? Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. And, and I think there's a, a question came in that was that was pretty specific. I'm going to kind of ask a bigger one and then mention this one is, you know, okay. where you might see this going in terms of changes to statute. Um, and in particular, the person asked, you know, well, shouldn't TLR maybe just consider requiring pressure cementing of all wells to prevent commingling? Well, I mean, so it is not going to make recommend. Um, it will discuss the scientific basis of what would be a reasonable consideration of commingling if you're talking about a brackish well. It's not going to, you know, go f- much further afield. I think that the question is, though, uh, there's a lot of interpretation in the definition as it sits. And so that's what we're trying to to put some understanding around. You know, how what is the potential for this to be occurring? How frequent would this be? And then from a brackish perspective, you know, and, 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 and at what point should that be worried? I don't think there's any question on anyone's mind, should we protect fresh water. That's right, we should. And in fact, it's consistently required across all statutes. Um, so it becomes this question of um, differing water quality um, and degradation. And so v- there's various opinions that should be tied to water use, that should be, um, th- there's there are various opinions that have already been stated. So that's what we're hoping to uh, build the scientific basis like look at the data both in detail and a bit more of a regional survey approach to say yeah you know this 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 likely is an issue could be an issue in these aquifers and here's some evidence for where it would be occurring so what would be a what would be a logical way to uh, consider this from the brackish groundwater development perspective so so to go back to it, should we pressure grant all wells? Yeah, I think we should properly um, complete wells in all cases. Um, it, then the question becomes, what is commingling? That that doesn't still get to answer that question. And that's where we're trying to dive a little deeper into that. And okay. we will talk about well completion standards also. We're reviewing those. Okay, all right, wonderful. Well, thank you all. We are out of time, but I want to appreciate you all participating, sharing information on these projects. Um, I'm going to make another shameless plug for my weekly updates because they always contain information on who you can email to get on the stakeholder list, what's going on. Um, It's it's all there. Uh, The data requests go out in the weekly emails. And so we at TAG will keep you informed of what's going on with these studies, but also give you the, the tools to get involved yourself. So, so thank you all. Appreciate your participation and uh, hope to see you at our happy hour.